Welcome back everybody to our course Introduction to Quantum Optics. Today we want to discuss the interpretation of the Bloch vector and familiarize ourselves with the U and V parts of the Bloch vector. The W1 we remember already that had an intuitive meaning that was just the inversion in our two-level system, but what about these U and V parts? So remember we had uh, in the last class we had found that we can describe any state of our two-level atom, any density matrix in terms of these three real components, u, v, and w, that make up our Bloch vector. And they were constrained in the following form, to lie within a unit sphere uh, of the system. And if the radius of this Bloch vector is 1, it's a pure state. If the radius is smaller than 1, then we're in a mixed state of our density matrix. Now, as I said, w we already know. w, when it was minus 1, described an atom in the ground state. When w was plus 1, the inversion, then it described an atom in the excited state. And today, everything is about these u and v components of our Bloch vector. So in order to get a feeling for that, let's calculate, for example, the expectation value of our dipole matrix element as a function of time. So for example, let's calculate the ith component, let's say the x component of our dipole operator. And to do that, well, basically, I just have to take the trace of rho times d. Right? That's how in the density matrix formalism you calculate an expectation value. And if you write down now the density operator and the dipole moment operator in matrix form for the 2 by 2 system, we get our density matrix and we get our dipole operator in the 2 by 2 form. And remember, these vanished, the diagonal elements vanished because of the same parity of the states 1 and 2 they would actually give a vanishing dipole matrix element. And D12i then, for example, if I want to calculate, for example, the x component of my matrix element D12, that would be just given minus Q times x with x component operator of our electron, 1, 2. That's just an atomic physics property of our two-level atom, right? That's just determined by the states 1 and 2, expectation value of the x operator in the system. So if I now multiply this out, you actually see that the only terms that survive are the off-diagonal terms rho 1, 2 and rho 1, 2 star. So now I've written this in vector form. I have now the x component of the dipole operator, the y component and the z component gives us a vector for the dipole operator as a function of time. This is just now the vector of the dipole operator matrix element D12. So this would be the x component, the y component, and the z component, written now in vector form, times rho 1, 2 plus rho 1, 2 star. And rho 1, 2, remember, if I write this in terms of my tilde density matrix, that's just rho 1, 2 tilde times e to the i omega t. So now I can write the expectation value of the dipole operator in the following form. That's just a D12, the atomic physics property of my two-level atom, times rho 1, 2 tilde e to the i omega t plus the complex conjugate. So why am I introducing rho 1, 2 tilde? Well, remember the Bloch vector components, they were introduced in terms of these rho 1, 2 tilde components, right? So if I want to write this rho 1, 2 tilde in terms of the Bloch vector components, that would be u half plus i v half. And that's just rho 1, 2 tilde. And e to the i omega t, well, I can just use Euler formula. That's just cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. And the same thing here for the right-hand term, the complex conjugate of this. Now, if we multiply this out uh, and collect all the terms that we have, we find that the expectation value of our dipole operator, that's just this dipole operator matrix element, D12, again, atomic physics property, times u cosine omega t minus v sine omega t. So we actually find that we have a component oscillating at cosine omega t of the dipole moment and a term which oscillates as sine omega t given by the u and v components of the Bloch vector. Now, also recall that the light field that we've been using, interacting with the atom, that had the simple form polarization vector times amplitude times cosine omega t. So if we now look at how the atom reacts to this, this is the oscillating dipole moment induced in the atom. This is the drive field that's driving the atom. We see that the reaction of the atom to this drive is to oscillate at the frequency of the light field, cosine omega t and sine omega t, but with an in-phase component given by the u term. This is the in-phase component. 
and a 90 degree out of phase component. And this is given by the V part. So this V part is therefore also often called the quadrature component of the oscillating dipole moment inside the atom. And the U1 is the in-phase oscillating component. So U describes the in-phase oscillation of the dipole moment inside the atom, V the quadrature 90 degree out of phase oscillation within the atom. Now in order to get a bit more understanding which one of these components is for example responsible for energy exchange between the atom and the light field, at least in a classical picture first, let's go to a simple model of our electron inside the atom. So let's think of the electron here inside our atom and it's exposed to the oscillating electric field of the light given here as E of t, for example shown for a certain time. And now for a time t to t plus dt, this electron will have moved from r to r plus dr and the field will actually have performed work on the atom. How much work? Well, if we calculate the amount of work that's been performed on the atom, on the electron inside the atom, that's just the force acting on this electron times the displacement dr. The force acting onto the electron, that's just minus q times e of t, right, dr. So now we can calculate, in a classical picture at least, the exchange power between the electron or the atom and the field, that's just minus q e of t dr dt. So this is what I've written down here in the first part of this equation. If I would now do this for an ensemble of atoms with different velocities of the electrons inside the atom, then the average exchange power, let's write down here a classical expectation value over this ensemble of different atoms, the electrons in the atoms having different velocities, I'm just performing a classical average, then the average exchange power between those atoms and the light field would be just this prefactor here, epsilon e0 cosine omega t times the classical expectation value of the time derivative of the dipole moment of the electron inside the atom. Now, we can just transfer this formula into the quantum regime, write down the quantum mechanical analog of this equation. This would be now the quantum mechanical expectation value, giving us the average exchange power between an atom and the light field. And we see that would then just be given by the time derivative of the expectation value of the dipole operator. Now the dipole operator expectation value, this is exactly what we derived on the previous slides. This was just given by the dipole matrix element D12, U times cosine omega t minus V times sine omega t. So now we just take the time derivative of this, the sine omega t term giving us a omega cosine omega t term and the cosine omega t term giving us a minus omega sine omega t term and we just put the time derivative in here and then we write this down and this is what we find. So this would be the average exchange power between an atom and the light field at any instant of time t. Now one thing is that if we look at this equation at any instant of time this even includes this very very fast oscillation of the light field and typically we're not able to resolve, to resolve such kind of fast energy exchange processes. So let's kind of think more of the average time average exchanged energy between our atom and the light field. Now if I want to calculate the time averaged exchanged power sorry between the atom and the light field that would simply be given by doing a time average over one optical cycle which I can carry out by just integrating the left and right part of this equation from zero to capital T to one period of our oscillating field and dividing by one over capital T. Now if you do that you actually see that because of the opposite parity of cosine and sine omega t they have positive and negative contributions and when you integrate over those positive and negative contributions over one oscillation period of the light field that's just going to be zero. Whereas this part here, the sine squared omega t part, because it's always positive, has to give a positive average value and if you do the integral actually you find that's just minus one half. 
So let's pull this all together. Let's write this down. That would mean that the time averaged, let's denote time averaging by this bar, the time averaged exchanged power between the atom and the light field, that's just minus d12 epsilon times e0 times omega times v divided by 2. And now I can write this as minus h bar d12 epsilon e0 divided by h bar times omega times v half. And you see I'm doing this because this, that is just the Rabi frequency. That's just our omega zero. So the time average exchange power between the atom and the light field, that's just going to be minus h bar omega zero times omega times v over two. Right? So we actually see that the energy exchange, the absorption and emission, time average energy exchange between the atom and the light field, that's governed by the V component of the Bloch vector. And that's why this is called the absorptive component. It's actually, we could also call it the emission component. It's basically the one that is, that is driving the absorption and emission, the exchange of energy between the light field and the atom. That's what the V component is for, and that's why we call it the absorptive component. All right, that's all I wanted to tell you today. In the next lecture, we'll discuss the dynamical equations that govern the evolution of the Bloch vector, and we see that actually they're very, very simple and give us a very nice intuition of how this two-level atom reacts to a light field driving it. Thanks a lot for watching, and see you in the next class.